A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations, not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering wick he shall not quench, until he establishes justice on the earth. The coastlands will wait for his teaching. I, the Lord, have called you for the victory of justice. I have grasped you by the hand. I formed you and set you as a covenant of the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from confinement, and from the dungeon those who live in darkness. Pebum Domini. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter proceeded to speak to those gathered in the house of Cornelius, saying, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the Israelites, as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all what has happened over all Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Bebum Domini.
heavens were opened, and the voice of the Father thundered. This is my beloved Son, hear him. Dominus Vobiscum, et Rum Spiritum Tuo, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Matteo, Gloria Tibi Domine. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. Jesus said to him in reply, Allow it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. After Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And a voice came from the heavens, saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Verbum Domini Today we celebrate the baptism of the Lord, this uh, first Sunday in ordinary time, and it marks the beginning of Jesus' mission being sent out. He's revealing who he is as the Messiah. The Father proclaims it, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased, and the Holy Spirit sends him into the desert you know, to be tempted by Satan and begins his uh, public ministry. <clears throat> Here though Jesus is not receiving, of course, the sacrament of baptism, he institutes the sacraments. It is his paschal mystery that gives him the power to save and to heal us. It is the saving mysteries of his life that the sacraments put us in touch with, in contact with, that they, how we receive that grace that he merited for us is through the sacraments. Today we're told, though, that he submits to the baptism of John the Baptist. Remember, we're told in the Gospels that John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, not the sacramental baptism, and it involved a confession of sins and a, a turning from sin, a new start, you know, to prepare the way for the Lord to turn from sin, to turn uh, to the coming of Christ. So we see that John is a little startled you know he says i need to be baptized by you and yet you're coming to me jesus says allow it now for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness so we could say allow it for now this now implies a certain uh, reservation jesus is no sinner he has nothing to repent of he's the fullness of grace and truth but we told today that it's to fulfill all righteousness now pope Benedict has said in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, he speaks of righteousness as man's, at that time, in the context of the Torah, he said man's righteousness, it's his answer to the Torah, his response, his acceptance of the whole of God's will, bearing the yoke of God's kingdom. So this righteousness is an unrestricted yes to God's will. It's a statement of obedience. So it makes sense, you know, to fulfill the Torah, to receive it, to give God our fiat. You know, that's righteousness. And this is the beginning of Jesus' mission. As I said, the Holy Spirit sends him into the desert and he begins his ministry. 
So we're told, though, that Jesus was baptized. He goes down into the waters. And it's a powerful, powerful image, right? Because on the banks of the Jordan, all the sinners were coming out to repent, to turn from their sins, the tax collectors, the prostitutes. And, uh, you know, everyone was going out there in big crowds. And Jesus goes down into the waters where they are on the banks. And the image there is that Jesus is taking upon himself the sins of the people. He's taking that burden upon himself. And we know, you know, in the agony of the garden, that bloody sweat is the taking on of the sins. And he offers himself in sacrifice for our sins at Calvary. That's how he does it, through the Paschal mystery. So, and we see in the Gospels, Jesus uses the word baptism to refer to his death on Calvary, his future coming. So, in that death, he takes upon himself our sins. And going down into the waters, scripturally, would be an image of death, you know, to be covered over by the waters. But even more powerfully, you know, water is a symbol of life. And that's what happens at the Paschal Mystery. Jesus offers his sacrifice of his death for us, liberate us from sin, and also through his resurrection, though, he gives us new life. Water is needed for life, so it's a beautiful image of what happens to us in baptism. The church fathers, and some saw this as the institution of baptism, would say that, you know, that he sanctifies the waters of our baptism. You know, the future baptismal waters that we would receive are sanctified uh, today in this gospel uh, passage. I think that's a, a beautiful thought. You know, when we receive baptism, we're receiving his grace, his uh, sanctification. We know that in the sacrament of baptism for us today, the effects are that all our sins are forgiven. Original sin is washed uh, from us, cleansed from it. All personal sin, if we're baptized as an adult, and even the temporal punishment due to sin, scot-free. Right, that's uh, beautiful. I always like to talk to uh, adults who are baptized. What is it? What was that like? You know, it's such a huge, radical change. I mean, the list I'm about to give you—that you know—we're made a new creature. We're part made partakers of the divine nature. We become adopted children of God, sons in the Son. We're given the Holy Spirit. You know, we become temples of the Holy Spirit. We become co-heirs of Christ. We receive sanctifying grace, this divine life that we lost in the garden, that we're born without, is given back to us in baptism. We're given the theological virtues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He now prompts us and directs our life. We're given the infused moral virtues, prudence, justice, temperance. Um, I'm forgetting the fourth one. <laughs> Tell me. But... Uh, also, we're incorporated into the church more deeply, and we receive an, an indel indelible spiritual mark. A character is impressed upon our soul, not physical, but spiritual, that we belong to Christ, that we can now offer worship through his priesthood, that the baptized share in his priesthood. A huge, radical change in our being is received at baptism freed from sin, and reborn as sons of God, as children of God. So in baptism, we're born anew in confirmation. We're strengthened, sent on mission in the Eucharist. We're given food for the eternal life. That incorporation is deepened. That's what's happening to us as Christians. That's the work of our salvation, our sanctification, being done upon us by Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on Calvary. That Paschal mystery as applied to us, and we're radically made new. That's what happens in the sacraments. And we see today in the, in the scene that the heavens were open for him. He comes out of the waters, and the heavens were open. You know, he goes down into the waters of death, comes up, and the heavens are open. What an image for us. Jesus tears open heaven for us. We were shut out due to sin. He opens it for us again. And as sons we see the promised inheritance. Isn't that one of the deepest aspects of sonship that we're given an inheritance, right? We're part of the family. And that inheritance of heaven is what we're destined for. You know, he does all this. All this happens at the Jordan. And remember, 
when the Jews were wandering, the Israelites were wandering in the desert, when they were going to cross into the promised land, they kind of they crossed in from the east, and they crossed the Jordan, right? That's a beautiful image. That promised land, you know, in the New Testament, the fulfillment of that is our heavenly life. When we're crossing through the waters of baptism, we're given that new heavenly life of which uh, the promised land was an image of. So the Holy Spirit comes upon him. He receives his mission, so to speak, and he is the Christ. He is the anointed one, the Messiah. And in baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the sonship, and through uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit, we can call God Father. We can call him Abba. As Galatians 4, 6 tells us, as proof that you are children, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. That Holy Spirit poured into our hearts. Romans 5.5 5 says that the love of God has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. That charity, that love that God has for us really changes us, creates something new in us, and unites us to himself. So much so that we can call God Father, we can call him Abba. Beautiful, amazing gifts. I left part of my homily. <laughs> so the main theme I wanted to preach on today, though, is this idea of sonship, being made a child of God, a son or a daughter of God, sons in the son, that through this baptism incorporated into Jesus, we share in his very relationship that he has with his heavenly father, that we share in the divine knowing and loving to know and love as God does partakers in his nature that were raised up. We're still creatures. We still have a human nature, but through grace, we're raised up to share in his life. And not just a cold kind of change of nature. That seems kind of cold to me. We're made sons. We're made children, right? It's a, a deep relationship of love, right? That's the cause of it. That's what, that's what makes it happen. If we think of what sonship is, you know, Jesus gives us that great uh, parable of the prodigal son. You know, prodigal means, you know, one who spends extravagantly, you know, who's wasteful with the money. And that's what the prodigal son does, right? He takes the inheritance and he goes off and squanders it, right? And we have done that as man has done that as a whole, right? We're given this, this great inheritance made in the image and likeness of God. We squander it. We spend it on false idols and not on God. We spend, uh, squander our inner life, that precious treasure that we can, you know, through a rational soul, we can know and love God. We squander it on other things. We waste the relationship. But in the parable, the father waits for the son. He waits for the son to come home and to dwell again in the father's house. Right? We are children in our father's house baptism makes us a son and i can say that i'm a son in my father's house i can have that peace of knowing his love for me not a slave but a son that love that the father has for the son in the parable is a constant unchanging love you cannot lose it he welcomes the son home not demanding uh, repayment not demanding repayment, just welcomes him home into his house again. We know that our sins are swallowed up in the divine mercy. They are forgiven. They're not just simply ignored, or we don't, you know, God doesn't act like they don't matter, right? We look at the crucifixion, we can say our, our sins matter, but they are forgiven, and we experience his love, his forgiveness, his mercy, and this love renews us. It lifts us up. We experience what it's like to be loved as, as a son when we are forgiven. You know, it's not a humiliating love. So we all can wander, but we can all always come home again. This relationship, as I said, is poured upon us in baptism. We're made, adopted by his grace. We're made children. You know, it's very true in a sense. We're all children, we're all made in the image of God. We share in that, 
that image, and we come from God, right? At all our conceptions, God, through an immediate act of creation, creates the soul, so he directly wills you into existence. We can say we come from God in that sense, so there's this great unity in the human family. Our parents participate in our creation. We, we say they procreate, we procreate, but in the sacraments, this likeness is restored to us. This communion with God is brought to a new level. We are adopted by his grace. He sanctifies the waters of that baptism for us today and affects that real change in us. We hear today that the Father is there as well, and he says, you know, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. When Jesus comes out of the waters today, this voice from heaven, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. You know, how we long to hear this voice, how we all know deep down that we, may, we need to be made new in Christ, that we need this forgiveness of sins, that we need his Holy Spirit. We need to hear this voice in our prayer life because we need to know that we are loved as his children, that we are loved as his children. I had a, a friend of mine who was recounting a, a story he heard a preacher say, and I don't have the whole story, but it struck me that there was this uh, little girl in a, like elementary school or something, and she had a hair lip. She had this deformity. She was ostracized, made fun of, humiliated. And one day, the, the teacher, you know, played that game of starting a secret, you know, and the children would pass it around. And the secret she told this little girl was, you know, I wish you were mine. I wish you were mine. I thought that was such a, a beautiful story because it said how that changed this girl's perspective. That's what she wanted to hear. She felt isolated. And I, and I thought, that's what a life of sin does to us. It isolates us. It leaves us by the curb. You know, eventually the world will abandon us, and maybe our own judgment is the worst. You know, we condemn ourselves, but God loves us, and he tells us, I wish you were mine, right? He wants us to belong to his family, right? And you might feel that isolation yourself and sin, but in baptism, the catechism tells us baptism seals the Christian with the indelible spiritual mark, character, of his belonging to Christ. No sin can erase this mark, even if sin prevents baptism from bearing the fruits of salvation, right? We never can lose this mark. It's indelible. I wish you were mine, meaning that we do belong to Christ, you know, through baptism. He does tell us that in a very real way. And as I said, after this, Jesus goes into the desert to be tempted, and we see that Satan goes right after this, right? He says, if you are the Son of God, you know, turn these stones into bread. If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from the, the temple, right? He wants to, to attack this identity, and that's true for us today, right? He wants to tempt us uh, from this knowledge, from this awareness, certainly from living out this filial relationship that we have in baptism. He wants to tear that from us. But, you know, we can't. I mean, we can't let him do that, right? By our own decision, we stay in communion with God through the sacraments, through a prayer life, through confession of sin. We hold on to that, that relationship, and we can enjoy uh, the fruits of that relationship in our heavenly life that we're destined for. Now, praise God. Praise God we share in that relationship, and it is a free gift to us today.